This presentation was recorded at the 12th International Conference on Rapid Response Systems and Medical Emergency Teams. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning to talk about training outreach personnel in the UK. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, so what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning is set the scene in the UK, um, but specifically focus on our regional approach to training and then reflect upon lessons learned which may be useful for some of you guys here. So all of our healthcare systems has its culture and challenges. And here's a few facts and figures about the uh, NHS that you can read at a later date, but certainly we've got uh, our share of challenges. Um, mainly, we've got fewer beds, critical care and acute beds, than probably any other developed system in the world. And this has really influenced the way critical care outreach has been um, implemented and developed. So my colleague John very ably uh, described the uh, British model of outreach yesterday. But just to recap, it's predominantly nurse-led and nurse-delivered. And we draw upon mainly experienced ICU nurses for our workforce, but um, also acute care nurses and also some physios. And I, I've met um, a colleague today. But um, the big difference is, is that it's not medically led. Um, also, the National Outreach Forum have been very influential, and we've got the uh, description of what outreach is here on your right, and also the objectives. So training has been directed to meet these objectives. Um, refreshingly of late, um, the uh, outreach has been described as safety engines of the hospital and also system and silo infiltrators, which I think is picking up on some of the hidden value that outreach can bring. So I haven't got time to go through the entire um, UK educational system, but suffice to say until quite recently, pre-reg training um, really paid little attention to deteriorating patient and acute care. And um, we've had specific sets of competencies for uh, specific sets of professional groups but really not a great deal for uh, outreach and, until recently. And um, as I say, recently, the National Outreach Forum have described the concept of comprehensive critical care outreach as a continuum. And it's exemplified by these seven elements, um, which you can remember by the PREPARE acronym. So it hasn't been just about the rapid response. It's also been very much about the preemptive care and um, very much about the education, which I think Anne and Ronaldo alluded to. And uh, in 2012, the Outreach Forum uh, published a standardized framework for the implementation and delivery of outreach services. So this first iteration has actually been really very helpful. Uh, it's had the support of a lot of professional bodies. Um, however, the emphasis has been really on operational standards, and it's been a bit competency light. Um, but nonetheless, it's enabled benchmarking of services, and it's given teams a bit of clout, something to wave at their managers to say, hey, this is what we need to do our job. So it's due for review. And we're rather hoping that perhaps it might be informed by some of the discussions um, we've had these two days. So moving on to our network approach to training. This is a few um, facts and figures about uh, the network I work in. Um, it's the most uh, northerly. Um, have I got a pointer here? There, I think this is Scotland here. I haven't got any pretty pictures. So we're coast to coast, um, pretty diverse, some small hospitals, some very large. Um, and we have 12 outreach teams and between uh, 60 and, and 70 staff. So back in the day, when I moved up, when this Wiltshire lass moved up uh, north to take up a job as a nurse consultant post, this really was 
the uh, statement in my job description. John's smiling because I think we all had one of these. Um, yeah, can you just set up a critical care outreach and follow-up service? Um, yeah, okay, that's no problem. Um, but probably um, need some kind of training program. But for people like me, this was a, something to get my teeth around. Um, so uh, put, put our heads together. My predecessor, Louise, and one of my consultant colleagues, Emilio, said, well, look, why don't we do something that's region-wide and transferable? So fast forward, after a lot of really hard work, um, we've got something that we call CORC, the Critical Care Outreach Course. And this is a part-time practice-focused but work-based educational framework and competency package and it aims to address the educational needs of outreach practitioners um, so it's fit for purpose but we also wanted it so it's transferable across our region we also um, wanted to ensure that people could um, integrate this into their academic pathway so it can be um, taken at three levels certificate level but also um, degree and masters as well so here are some of the um, learners, affectionately known as corkers. And um, they, they quite like it, really. They are corkers. And uh, we run about one or two courses a year, mainly one. It's run over nine months. The faculty consists of um, mainly consultant intensivists, uh, trainees and advanced practitioners. Um, they don't have time in their job plan, really, so they use their non-clinical time to do this. Uh, we use the hospital facilities within my network for free. Um, we have some support with admin, with recruitment and selection. Groups are quite small, six, uh, 8 to 16. Must be supported by the line manager, because often you get the wrong people applying for this. And must have written, um, uh, um, have a consultant supervisor that's prepared to sponsor them. Um, about 10 days in all. Prerequisite is basic clinical skills. We don't teach that. And uh, I've put that in a pink box there. The consultant supervisor is key. So course materials, we have the usual manual CD, handbooks, um, but we also have um, a website. And we also have a Twitter account. And now the younger ones just tweet me if they can't find the car park or, or something. So. Uh, I kind of have to get rid with the program, really, to uh, keep up with it all. Um, again, can't go into all the content, um, but uh, we have a one-day induction. Uh, we have about eight direct teaching days, which covers about 40 different seminars with all your systems and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot on portfolio development. Um, now, the notional workload on this is about 400 hours. So this is absolutely not for sissies. It really is quite a commitment, um, as some of the corkers would tell you. Teaching and learning strategies, the usual sp suspects. I'm really envious of Anne's simulation um, opportunities over there. Um, but we do uh, do team um, simulation scenarios and a lot of interactive case-based seminars and the, the caucus will come and um, present some of their cases as well and of course a lot of more use of youtube video links etc etc um so i said in the previous slide we were really keen that you saw 400 um hours that uh, the the learners got um some credit and so mainly the stuff i do now i'm not so clinical is the academic content and this is uh, all the other stuff that we've heard about uh, these two days, which is behaviours, change, leadership, human factors, ethical decision making, and all the things that we know are really, really important. And uh, we have a key um, academic partner in Northumbria University. The portfolio is the central um, element of the whole um, course. And in fact, I've seen some magnificent specimens. Um, they, they carry them around with them for a very long time. Nine months become very attached. And so, in fact, when they come to hand them in, I give them a slip, a receipt, in case that I'm hit by a bus. So they, they don't have to resubmit it. 
Um, so basically, it's a log of everything they've done, their evidence of learning, including their log of histories, decision making, decision trees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then we have the assessment strategy, which is, is reasonably robust. The completion of all of the elements uh, has to be um, signed off um, by the consultant uh, supervisor before they can progress to assessment. And we get them to hand in their portfolio about two weeks before, so their head's clear, ready for their um, assessment, which is, you know, moulage, scenario, MCQs, OSCEs. And I will mark, the por uh, and a colleague will mark the portfolios. Um, and so we have uh, the results before they sit the assessment. And then I also give them a 15-minute individual feedback on their um, portfolio. And ta-da, you get a lovely pretty pink um, certificate and boy they love them and it goes in their um, uh, portfolios and they can as I say ap uh, apply for uh, academic credit in whatever pathway they uh, choose to take. Now this it has evaluated extremely well we've had about 80 which might not seem a lot but it, it, I think you know these small groups are really valuable and there is a self-assessed um, uh, increase in expertise grading in all the 17 competency domains. Across our network, it's really well supported at a very high level, executive board level, and, and last year it was approved as uh, an example of best practice by the National Outreach Forum. The participants themselves um, just say it's, so, it's tough but fabulous, like the best course they've ever done because it really is fit for purpose. And... Um, I think it, it helps them feel prepared for the, the big, wide, and pretty ugly world sometimes. So lessons learned along the way. Taught curricula has very little influence on practice behaviors, and I think we're kind of that, that penny's dropping. It requires role modeling and good mentorship in the, the practice environment, and that's hard to do when we're time um, compressed. The consultant supervisor is key. Act, access to that clinical wisdom and that one-on-one -on -one for clinical discussions is vital. On a, a more negative note, it's a significant workload on a, a very small faculty. Um, and the up-to-date, um, keeping the course materials up-to-date is really hard. We're already lagging behind by, with our third um, manual, so we're wondering whether we should kind of just switch to something that's already out there. Integrating Cork into an academic pathway has been really difficult. I've had to battle with three universities because it doesn't fit into their pathways, and you know, people out there might understand that. But I think with my role as the network, now I am in a position that I can negotiate to say, well, please, can you deliver what we need? So that's been um, helpful. Um, high attrition rate is not a failure. I thought it was. Probably about 50% have dropped out uh, over the last eight years, but that's usually a self-selection. It is quite a tough job, uh, and uh, it is quite a tough course, and it kind of, if you can't stick the course, you probably aren't quite right for the job. So that may, may sound tough. You can challenge me on that uh, if you like. Moving forward, we've got to start looking uh, through the generational lens. Certainly in the NHS, we've got four um, generations working side by side, and they've all got different uh, learning styles. And I think these concepts require consideration. Um, and we have to adapt our training um, to stay responsive to this. I haven't had time to touch on this this morning, but we've also got involved patients in the co-design and delivery of educational packages, particularly in the outreach patient interface where, you know, we, we really play quite an important role. Um, so to conclude, good training is a real challenge for all of us, and I think we've heard that today. In the UK, we certainly need to develop and um, galvanise um, our North standards and competencies with the em emphasis on the competi competencies. We also need to embed this as essential and not desirable. Organizations need to know if you want good outreach, good rapid response, then you've got to train us and give us the tools to do that. 
And after today, I think perhaps possibly we could agree on some core international standards, so that would be really good. I would like to thank these two people, particularly Emil, uh, Emilio Garcia and Isabel Gonzalez, for their tireless contribution to the Cork. And uh, thank you very much for listening.